We had a most beautiful drive here this morning. It's clear, not quite to Catalina, but you can see everything. It was nice. You live in a beautiful place. <clears throat> Got you kind of spread out here this morning. Come on now, confess. How many of you didn't remember the clock thing? A couple of us. That's all right. I was saying in, in a Christian center, we used to buy donuts once a year for this day so that we knew that everyone would be late. So those that got there on time, we could have the donuts and drink coffee until everybody else got there. <laughs> when they got there, we went ahead. As we were singing this song, and I don't think I've shared this story here before. If I have, forgive me. For, it looks like we have enough new folks that it will at least entertain you momentarily. I said about this tiny offering that I have to share. It always reminds me of the story of the little boy in Chicago who sold newspapers on the street. And on Sunday morning, he was out, and because people would come into these churches <clears throat> in Chicago, with maybe a church on every corner there, and he could sell a lot of papers. And so he was selling papers, and it started pouring rain, just that cold Chicago kind of wet and. So he decided to pick up his papers and duck into the church where everybody else was, and it was warm, and he stood inside with his stack of papers and stood back against the back wall, and he heard the message that was being talked about, the good news of salvation. He heard of Jesus' great love for him. For the first time, he, he got a hold of the truth in his heart as a young boy, and just after that, they came with the offering. And he watched that, you know, when the, when the plate came down my aisle, I asked the ushers, I said, which one of these am I supposed to take? That might sink in. I thought you were offering me. So the plate came to the little boy. The usher came over to the little boy with his newspaper stack and the offering plate and the boy gestured, could you lower it a little? So he got it down there and he gestured again until he had that usher and that plate on the floor. And when the usher got that offering plate on the floor, the little boy stepped into it. Maybe a tiny offering, but that's the one Jesus is looking for. And it's not about money at all. That little guy got it. He said, this is my response to the great love of Jesus. That's powerful, isn't it? We're in Mark chapter 1 this morning, and I think it's a fitting introduction. In Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The door had closed on John's ministry, John the Baptist, and as soon as that happened, Jesus came out, saying, this is the message we need to repent and believe in the good news. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. Follow me. Jesus said, follow me. How many of you are following him today? Some of us following Jesus This word follow, we like to kind of look 
behind the scenes at the original language from time to time and say, well, what was he really saying? And it's always funny when you say, well, follow in the Greek means follow. Not a deep study, but listen to this definition of this Greek word. To accompany, to go along with, to go the same way with, to follow one who precedes. The word is a compound word and the first means, the A means with, and the rest of the word means a road. It means being on the same roadway with someone. The word was used for soldiers and you can see a lineup of those guys and they say, follow me, here they come. The word was used for servants. Follow me, and the servant's job was to follow was used for pupils, teachers saying, come, follow me. You know, this time when this was happening, there were rabbis everywhere, teachers, leaders. Paul the Apostle mentioned that he had grown up under the, uh, the rabbi Gamaliel. And so what happened is young men became of age, the older men who were the rabbis, the teachers, the leaders, would look and search out for the younger ones and say to them, come follow me. And that little guy would come and be a, a follower of that rabbi. And uh, as some others have said, that uh, one of the little short sayings they used in that time was, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. Which means maybe you, would you follow him so closely that the dust coming off of his sandals would collect on you because you were behind him. May the dust of your rabbi be upon you. May you be covered in it. So pupils would follow. Now, if you weren't chosen, if you were a young man and you weren't chosen to follow some rabbi and become a, a learner of the law and the ways of the, of the law and, the, and the, the church, so to speak, the synagogue, then you were just kind of went back to your trade. You just go back to your dad or, and do what he does. You're not going to be a follower of a, of a rabbi. Go do your trade. So these guys in their boats, they were the unaccepted ones. They had not been chosen to follow a rabbi. They had gone back to the family business to make their life, and they were fishing. And who did Jesus pick? Jesus came along as the rabbi of rabbis and said, follow me. Now maybe they, I don't know, James and John, Simon and Andrew, maybe they jumped up and down in the boat and on the beach went, hey, we finally got picked. We finally got picked. We get to be followers. They knew they had been rejected by the religious system and they weren't chosen to follow up in the ways of the existing rabbis. But when Jesus came by, and I believe they knew him, of course, this wasn't a surprise visit. They'd known him before this moment. He said, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Did they think about it? My, my verse says immediately. Immediately. And when he comes to find James and John, he called them. Immediately, it says, twice for us. Immediately. I think it's important for us to notice that. It's not a time to wonder, not a time to debate. It's time to decide. And may I say to some of you here this morning, perhaps, it's time to decide. Now, you might, some of you as believers are saying, well, he's probably talking to somebody that might be here that doesn't know Jesus. That's true. I'm talking to them. Of course, if you don't know Jesus personally as your Lord and Savior, if you've not asked him to be in control of your life and your future, you need to do that today. It's time to decide. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. You have no guarantees. I have no guarantee I'll make it home today. I hope I don't drive off the edge of the cliff on the way back because I have my son-in-law and my daughter with me, and I'd hate for that to happen to them. But for me, that'd be fine. I don't mind. I'm looking forward to heaven, you know. I'm thinking it's going to be okay, but I don't need to take them with me. But we have no guarantees, right? One of my close associates at, at where I'm working said on Wednesday morning, not to me, but to other co-workers, simply stated, I don't feel so good. I work in a hospital district at the Bear Valley Community Hospital. 
I teach mom and dad classes. I don't do medical stuff. But she said, I don't feel so good. I hope I don't die today. And she's a joker. But later on in the day, she went back to the ER and said, you know, I just don't feel too good. And within minutes, she was gone. Surprising. Embolism. Just boom. Color faded. Gone. The head of our entire auxiliary. What guarantees do we have? Today's the day of salvation. Today's the time to decide. It needs to be an immediate thing. When you're confronted with Jesus as the Lord, the God of all of the universe and the Son of God who came to live in your and die in your place and to take your sins and his body on the cross, I mean, it's time to decide. Quit putting it off. I mean, you're going to do it sooner or later. You might as well do it today. Right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. You'd be somewhere else. You'd be the coffee place or having a taco somewhere. Immediately, they decided. But let me remind us as believers, we have to decide too. See, to become a follower, one who joins on the road with Jesus... There's just five things that, that earmark a follower of Jesus. And you could probably come up with a list of 50 if you want it. But how about these five? One, a transformation of lifestyle occurs when you become a follower of Jesus. What am I saying? The fishermen were no longer fishermen. Oh, it was in them. You weren't going to get it out of them. Later on when Jesus is you know, crucified, they go back fishing a little bit. Right? Even when they needed some tax money, Jesus said, Peter, you, you like to fish? Go on down there and get us a fish with a coin in its mouth and we'll take care of our taxes. They knew how to fish. But a lifestyle transformation was the first thing they hit. They were no longer fishermen. They left their nets. They left their boats. They left their business. Two, when you're transformed by Jesus and you become a follower of Jesus, your primary function is to serve others. Now, when I say that, I know there are like four basic personality types in humanity. And some of the personality types go, serve others? Are you kidding? It's not me. I want them to serve me. Now, I'm sure that's none of us in the room. But Peter was one of those guys. Ambitious, bold, uh, lion type, just hard charging, in charge, leadership oriented. Just, and you say to them, your chief goal in transformed life produces servanthood to others. Right? And they go, oh, we just chafe at that. But you can't get around it. You have to be a servant of others. Jesus had his guys in for dinner one night, right? What did he do? John chapter 13, he wrapped a towel around his waist. He got down and he started washing feet. Peter was the one who said, no, 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 not me. Well, okay, wash my whole body. No, Peter, just settle down. Okay? When he got down, he put everything aside. He said, do you know what I've done? I've given you an example. You call me Lord and Master, and rightly so, because I am the Lord and I am the master, and I'm washing your feet. I'm giving you an example of how you're supposed to live for others. And it doesn't matter what personality type you are or what station in life you have, you and I are called, once we've been come to follow Jesus, to serve others. Esteeming others greater than ourselves. Lifting others into a place of more wholeness, helping others get to where they need to go. You'll get up soon enough. You know, if you help enough, enough people up, they'll reach down and pull you up with them. Don't worry about it. You'll get there. And besides, others are supposed to serve you anyway. So yours is coming, right? Principally centered in the scriptures, what you, what you sow, you will reap. It comes around because that's his kingdom. Third, 
We're called to bear the cost of our following Jesus personally. Bear the cost personally. I think of the guy on the road to Jericho. Right? The religious leaders went by, but the Samaritan guy picked him up, put him on his own animal, took him to town, put him in the hotel, took care of him himself until the next day, and then provided funding to take care of him until he got back. And he'd never even met the guy. We're to bear the cost of discipleship and following Jesus personally. It's going to cost you. Let's just take the gloves off. It's going to cost you. This is no free ride. You know, sometimes we portray the good news of Jesus as everything comes for free now. Everything's just going to be easy. Everything's going to be wonderful. It's not so. You know me, usually I'm happy and jovial. This morning I don't feel so happy and jovial. I mean, I might get a joke in every now and then and try and lighten it up, but there's this call to discipleship, this call to following Jesus is to get on the road with him, share the walk with him, do it his way, not mine. And it's supposed to be life transforming. And there's a cost. Cost your time. Cost your pride. Cost your finances. Cost your friends. Some of you young people are walking with Jesus. I, I can think back to when I accepted Jesus and I thought, Wow, this is it. I mean, I found it. This is everything I ever needed. He is all I need. And I began to share that with my friends, and I lost all my friends. I couldn't believe they didn't want to know. I thought, what's the matter with you? They said, you're an idiot. I said, yeah, but it's okay. I mean, you're supposed to be an idiot for Jesus or whatever. I mean, it's all right. And they thought, I just watched them all drift away. I talked to a young man. Well, he's young. He's been 38 this week. And he said, I am, he just decided last couple of weeks to turn his life around and surrender everything to Jesus. And he said, I'm losing all my friends. I said, congratulations. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. I mean, do your best to be nice to them. But the Bible says they wonder why you don't run off and play with them anymore. And they're going to. So there's a personal cost. I said, God's going to give you some new friends. It's going to be Okay. And, and they're going to be different. They're going to encourage you. And we're supposed to love one another, and serve one another, and walk with Jesus together. If they don't want to come, you can't force them. Just be nice to them. Maybe later they'll come back. There's a personal cost that we must bear to follow Jesus. And how often should we follow Jesus? Number four, occasionally. <laughs> Weekly. Um, daily yeah daily Jesus said take up your cross and follow daily isn't it nice I'm speaking to a different personality type here you're the ones that like things in order you like things lists you like you're calculated you're sort of like the accountants you want to know one through ten how to follow Jesus you want a book that shows you how to do it and do it perfectly any of you yeah I mean, let's admit it. Some of us were just different. And for you, the Bible is perfect because it doesn't leave any guesswork. It says, this is how to do it. It says, do this, and then you follow that, and do this, and these are things that you can do to make sure you're following Jesus. And on this one, it didn't leave it to guesswork. It said, number one, follow daily. All right? It's my number four. I don't want to confuse you, but I'm not really the note kind of guy. I'm just saying, follow is moment by moment I heard. Breath by breath. Yes. Am I being, can we use the picture again? Am I being covered in the dust of my rabbi? Jesus requires exclusive loyalty. I hope that sinks in a little bit for us. Exclusive. What does that mean, Exclusive. Everybody else out. Everything else out. Exclusive. Loyalty. Swing away to the other side of that. Judas didn't make it. Right? 
Judas had a divided loyalty. And it didn't work out for him. That's just a biblical illustration. You know others who waver in their loyalty to Jesus. They're loyal sometimes, not so loyal next time, and a little bit in, a little bit out. Jesus requires exclusive loyalty. He must be first. Otherwise, you can't call him Lord or Master. There's a danger for us as followers of Jesus that we want to make him into our image instead of allowing him to make us in his. The final one that I have written down, it's not final by any means, it just happens to be the last one I wrote, is the true followership of Jesus leads in the end result to martyrdom. Are we all going to die for Jesus? Well, I hope I die in Jesus. I'm not looking forward to dying for him necessarily. But do you know that right now as we're standing here, the rates are somewhere around 1,200 per month are surrendering their life because of their testimony for Jesus. It's still happening. The early disciples, the apostles, under the persecutions, Nero, people have always had to give their life for their faith in Christ. Not just for some random faith, not just for some belief system. People will die for a lot of things. But there are those that say, you must renounce your faith in Jesus and we'll let you live. Then let me die. Story after story, one that just again pops into my mind of the hundreds of stories I've read was the family who was brought before their captors and said, you must renounce your faith in Christ or we're going to kill you. And they said no, and they had a couple of little children. So what they did is they dug a big hole and they put them in the hole and they said, we're just going to bury you alive, which is not uncommon. It's a practice. I'm going to bury you alive for your faith. Well, what did that mean? As they shoveled the dirt into the hole, that meant the kids were going to go first because they're shorter. Let's just look at it in reality. And they, and they were singing. They said, let's sing. Let's worship. Let's be like Paul and Silas locked down in their prison. And they began to sing their songs of praise to Jesus. And about the time the dirt was getting to the mouths of the children and they were starting to be muffled the father began to crack. And the little one yanked on his dad's hand and said, no, dad, don't do it. We'll be with Jesus soon. As their mouths were muffled and they watched their child's lives extinguished for their faith. That's just one. We could tell that story 1,200 times a month right now around the world. When Jesus said to these guys, follow me, they couldn't possibly calculate what that meant. They just had to decide. When Jesus came to you and I and said, follow me, I promise you life eternal. I promise you eternal fellowship with me. I'll lead you, I'll guide you, I'll train you, I'll equip you. There's no way we could calculate the cost in that moment. It was a heart decision, it was a faith decision, and that's all we needed was to say, Jesus picked me. Seven billion people on the planet, and he put his hand on me and said, I love you, come follow me. Of course we should say yes to that. And then as we follow, we find out the road can get a little tough. There are other times when it's like driving the rim and you get to see everything and it's beautiful and there's no problems. We sang this morning, you know, when life's pleasant, all praise to you. When things go bad, all praise to you. It's a little tougher, but I'm going to do it. This is a call to followership. This is not a democratic society we're living in anymore. We're in the kingdom of God where there's a king and there's a Lord and there's a master. Amen. He requires it all. It's not optional. It's not American. 
<laughs> I've been around the world. I've landed on airstrips and airplanes that I thought was going to rip the wheels off the doggone plane. I mean, I've done the kiss the planet thing, like I'm glad to be home. Thank you, Jesus. But I'll tell you what I learned when I was in other countries is that Jesus is not an American. And we don't practice Christianity around the world all the time like we do here. It's surprising they don't do it the way we think it should be done. Some of them have a greater level of poverty. Some of the happiest places on earth are the most poverty-ridden places you could ever go. They have nothing. I mean nothing. But when they have Jesus, they have everything. And whatever they have, you're going to get because you're their guest and they know him. I've, I've been tempted to drink the last cup of hot chocolate in a little Mexican village where the kids only see hot chocolate maybe once a year, maybe once every five years, and they made it for us. I mean, I'm holding that cup, and I've got 20 little kids staring at me. I'm thinking, how am I going to drink this? How can I possibly? I felt like, you know, David should just pour it out as an offering to the Lord. Fortunately, there was a language barrier that they didn't understand to me. I didn't understand them, so I said to the team I was with, hey, guys, I got an idea. You don't even like the taste of this stuff. And they said, yeah, it's really different. Well, it's made out of cornmeal. I mean, come on. <laughs> cornmeal and chocolate. It's not what you were thinking of the little thing at the 7-Eleven where you go, bzzz, and get your hot chocolate. I said, what's the greatest thing we could do with this? Let's give it to the kids. Oh, we were the heroes now. Giving away something we didn't even want. To those that had nothing but they were willing to give anything they had to you because you were a servant of Jesus. This discipleship stuff is real. This following Jesus stuff is serious business. Oh, by the way, these are my notes today. Look at that. And I'm, I'm just right here. The Tyndall Bible Dictionary defines a follower of Jesus or a follower just simply says someone who follows another person or another way of life and, important, submits himself to the discipline or teaching of that leader or of that way. Submits. Are you submitted to Jesus? Okay, jovial moment. I made you cry a couple times, and we felt it. Can we have a happy thought? Hey, Jeff, can we have a happy thought? I wrote a poem about disciples. It's not really a rhyming poem. But if we're talking about making followers of Jesus, here's some of what we have to deal with. Our definitions of discipleship. We glamorize, we homogenize, we plagiarize, and we systemize. Is discipleship teachable, reachable, doable, or not? Can I see one? Can I be one? Can I make one or not? Should one be Moravian, monastic, Puritan, or Baptist? Lutheran, Pietist, Anabaptist, or Methodist? Pentecostal, Episcopalian, Catholic or Presbyterian, Orthodox, Independent, Congregational, or maybe just alien. Is discipleship done best in the West, in the East, in Europe, or the Middle East? Is it done best by Latinos or Asians, Chinese or Australians? Should we follow the famous or the anonymous, the popular or the obscure? And which version of the Bible is important, I'm sure. Wycliffe, Tyndale, Coverdale, or Matthews, the Great Bible, Geneva, Bishops, or Dewey Rames, King James, Samuel Clark, Webster's, or Young's, Darby, English Revised, American Standard, or Weymouth, Moffat, Westminster, New Berkeley, Revised Standard, New Standard American, the New English, the Amplified, New International, Good news, 
trans, uh, the Jerusalem Bible, the New American Bible, the Living Bible, the New King James, the New Century, the New Jerusalem, the Revised English Bible, the New Revised Standard Version, the New International Readers, Contemporary English, or possibly the Net. The Message, New Living, Holman Christian, English Standard, Today's International, New International. Those are just all the English versions that have been printed between 1419 and 2005. Why do I share you with these things? Well, should we train these new followers of Jesus to be culturally relevant, traditionally minded, seeker friendly, or missional? Should it be a cell church, a house church with small groups or no groups? Do we choose to follow George Barna or Scott Boren, Carl George or Rick Warren, Witness Lee, Watchman Nee, Dawson Trotman or Joel Kabisky? <laughs> Bill Bright, Ralph Neighbor, Mario Vega, Martin Luther, Bill Fay, Bonhoeffer, James Engel, or Boozer, Cho or Chan, Randy Frasley, or John Wesley. Can you believe all that came out of my head? When I was thinking of it, I thought, no wonder we have a difficult time trying to get people to be followers of Jesus. It's like throw a dart, throw a dart at this thing and say, which, what do we do? I mean, there's so much to training and equipping that we never really get started with helping someone follow Jesus or being one ourselves. You know, if we distill all that, the Holy Spirit can distill all that and come out with a follower. really not, I'm not going to preach all this, really. In fact, I don't have a watch and I can't see the clock. You know, from where, from where I stand, the clock has a perfect reflection of a light bulb in it. And there's no way I can even tell what time it is. Well, you're keeping track, see there. <laughs> Thank you for that. One of the simplest definitions of a follower of Jesus was put out by the Bible. <laughs> okay? It's the verse we read. It's a person that follows Jesus, is being changed by him, and is on mission with him. It's this, follow me. I will make you into something else. I will transform your life. And then I'm going to show you how to reach others. It's just simple. Follow. Be transformed by your life with Jesus. And then tell others. When this follow me thing happened, I, I want to draw a difference. And maybe I'll do this just to bring it to an end. When Jesus said to those guys, follow me, it would be like grabbing you two guys right off the front row and Jesus saying, come follow me. And then two over here, come follow me. And he gathered up his guys. What did they have that we don't have? Hmm? Access. Access. They, we can't do this to Jesus. Right? Did you ever wonder, does Jesus snore? <laughs> I'm just trying to be real I mean they lived with him they ate with him they slept near him they walked the beach with him I think those questions I'm sorry I'm just that way it's like maybe he did who knows a little nasal or something <laughs> he was real he was in the flesh God in the flesh and, and for them, in Mark chapter 3, verse 14, it said he chose them, number one, to be with him. These he chose. Look at it, if you haven't seen that, verse 3, chapter 3, 14 of Mark. Then he appointed 12 that they might be with him. He brought them alongside of himself to be learners. That's the word mathetes. We've talked about it before. Discipleship, followership of Jesus is a logical process. Math, mathetes, a disciple. 
But in that chapter 3, verse 14, it finishes by saying, and that he might send them out to preach and have power to heal the sickness, heal sicknesses and cast out demons. We'll come to that next week. They were, come, they were called to be with him, to learn of him, and to be sent out by him. And if you go back in, into Luke chapter 9 and Luke chapter 10, you'll find out that after he sent them out, they always came back and reported what happened. Remember he said, go out and do these things, preach the gospel, cast out demons, raise the, uh, raise the dead, heal the sick. They came back and said what? Even the demons are subject to us in your name. They were accountable. This wasn't a process where I get to be a follower and go do whatever I want to do, whenever I want to do it, and I'm never accountable to anybody. This is a problem in the body of Christ. There's a lot of no accountability going on. It's like, hey, Christianity is just for me. I do it my way. That's a real Western mentality. It's unfortunate. But we live in a very individualistic culture. It's almost narcissistic at times where we think everything centers around us. They had accountability. This, the, he sent out the 12, later says he sent out the 70, and they came back and gave a report of what happened when they were out there. In fact, Jesus was going to go to all the places where they preached, so he would be following up on them. Now, how about you and I? That's what they had, those four things. One, they were called to be with him. Two, they were going to learn from him. Three, they were going to be sent out to preach by him and authorized by him. And fourth, they were going to bring accountability in their followership. What happened while you were out there? Now it comes to you and I. Has this changed since the resurrection? Since Jesus went to the cross, was buried and raised again, has it changed? I want to submit to you that I think it has in one degree. I don't have Jesus to hold on to, but I do have you. This is the point I would make. You and I now are the body of Christ in the earth, right? We're the flesh and blood. We're embodied. I mean, he, he, he lives in us. I know I've said this before because it's one of my favorites. Learned it from the Presbyterians. The Jesus in me greets the Jesus in you. It's an acknowledgement when you see one another to remind each other that's more than you I'm looking at. It's the Christ in you. And it's the Christ in me. We're going to be together. We're united. We're now with the body of Christ. We're not going to be egocentric about it. But we, we do represent him in the earth. And how do I connect to Jesus today? When we bring somebody to follow Jesus. We don't say, now go in your closet and pray and only stay there. Just be you and him all the time. Read your Bible. Pray. Do these things and you'll become a disciple. No. We need the interaction with the body of Christ. The disciples had Jesus. We have one another. Who knows if you're growing or not? Do you? We're often not a good judge of our own growth. But if we're hanging around with somebody else, they can say to us, you're changing. You're not like you were a year ago. Do you know that? Your words have changed. Your attitude's different. You're living more biblically centered you used to hate people, and now you love people you don't even know. I watch you give things away to people that don't deserve it in my eyes, but evidently they do in your eyes because you're looking through the eyes of Jesus now. Are they turning them loose? No. <laughs> we think of the scripture, Matthew eighteen twenty says, where two or three are gathered together, in my name, what? He's in the midst. How do I get to follow Jesus? By getting together with two or three others, at least. How do I produce my accountability? Because it exists for us too. He calls us to be with him. That means being with one another. He calls us to learn of him. How do we do it? We do it with one another. Sure, we do it on our own, but we can't always do it on our own. 
He, he's called us to be filled and be sent out with power too. Acts chapter 1.8, right? He said, you'll receive power after the Holy Spirit comes on you and be my witnesses of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. How does that happen? By being infilled with the life of the Holy Spirit and by being with others. Not solo flying. And our accountability, let me close with this in Hebrew. Hebrews, <laughs> not in Hebrew, in Hebrews, that, chap, that book of the Bible that's about who makes the coffee. You knew that, right? I mean, it's not a new, I told that to a pastor last week and he said, I've never heard that. And I said, don't you read your Bible? I mean, sorry, anyway. Hebrews thirteen seven. Remember those who rule over you for who have spoken the word of God to you whose faith follow considering the outcome of their conduct. Remember those who rule. This one says rule. Your version might say more appropriately, remember those who lead over you. Those who are acting as Jesus, as Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. That's just a temporary thing, right? Right? You need somebody to be an example to you. God puts leaders in the body of Christ, those who are more advanced than me, more advanced than you, so we have some kind of a model to look at in the flesh. Another way to do it, somebody who can share with us their love, their faith, their servanthood, their ability to follow Jesus, and we can emulate them until we have such a grip on the life of Jesus ourselves that somebody starts to follow us. A true follower of Jesus is not complete until somebody's following you too. You that is, discipleship is not completed in you until you disciple someone else. And in verse 17 of this same chapter, it says, Obey those who lead over you and be submissive, for they must watch out for your souls as those who give account. Let them do it with joy and not with grief. That would be unprofitable to you. It's like a family, really. It's not a hierarchy. It's not a corporate structure. It's not a governmental system. It's a kingdom where we all come to the same king, but there are those who are ahead of us, and we can follow them as they follow Jesus and tell somebody can follow. We can all have somebody follow with us. We can all have somebody who we're working with to know Christ. Follow me. Go through the transformation. Go through the difficult decision of surrendering everything. Leaving, it says immediately they left Zebedee, their father, in the boat. Dad, we're gone. You've got the servants there. We're not abandoning you. You still have the business. It's going to work. Everything's functional. But we're going to follow Jesus. No more fishermen for us. We're going to learn how to fish for men. And in the body of Christ, those who lead over us, we can follow them. And they can govern over us and help us grow. We can submit to one another in love, not out of fear, not out of some uh, strong, dominant leadership or everybody follows me. But find somebody to hang out with and love Jesus with. If you're trapped in the, I'm doing this by myself trip, I have to just be me and Jesus all the time. You're being fooled by your culture. This is a hard one for us to hear sometimes. Maybe not for all of us, but for some of us, like, I don't, people say, I don't like people. I don't want to be with people. I like being with me and Jesus. You're being fooled. Because that's not what the Bible teaches You say you're following the scripture. You're not following the scripture. You're following a culture. I'm not just against our culture, by the way. I just have seen enough other cultures to know it works differently in other places. And they have their issues also. Joel Comiskey said in his most recent book, and I know you guys are aware of who Joel is, right? I mean, he's probably been here and preached, but... 2,000 years of small groups, he traces small group 
um, church all the way from the time of Jesus to today, historically. It's a great little book. Tons of research in there. On page 17, he says, one key reason Jesus chose the home as his operational headquarters was because he wanted to create a new spiritual family. And to make that happen, he first had to transform people where they lived and where essential character values were displayed. Where's that? In the home. Jesus wanted to infuse the normal family network with a new vision of love and sacrifice. To do this, he lived among his disciples in houses, showing them practically how to love and serve one another. Christ's teaching on true greatness, using children as an example, takes place in the context of a house setting. He wanted his disciples to see servanthood as the central leadership style and childlike dependence as the guiding light. Thanks for the illustration. Jesus didn't simply gather them once a week for a discipleship class. He lived with them. He shared financial resources. He taught them about kingdom values. He didn't only instruct his disciples about how to pray, but he asked them to accompany him to times of prayer so they could see him praying. When the disciples finally asked him what he was doing, he seized upon the opportunity to teach them about prayer. The disciples learned while doing but they were also guided to carefully reflect on what they did. They weren't just robots. Jesus showed his guys how to do it. They lived with him. Now he's not here. I have to live with you. Somebody, thank you. Somebody should learn to pray by hearing you pray. Not formal prayers, but just talking with Jesus. And they'll say, oh, you just talked to him. Okay, I get it. That's how it works. Followers, let's follow together. Amen? Let's live for Jesus together. Lord, this morning, I don't know how clear I've been, but I pray that your message will be engrafted into the heart of the hearers today. Lord, that you will draw us into a place of living reality. A place of loving one another, living with one another, sharing your life among us to the point that we know you're in the room every time we get together, wherever we are. Lord Jesus, we want your life manifested in the earth. We want your kingdom coming and your will being done in every situation that we are in. So infuse us with your life. Bond us to one another. Give us somebody to disciple with, to follow with. And give us somebody to lead in Jesus. All the glory is yours. The honor is yours. Amen. Amen.